rethink your financial advice process. Just review it. It might be perfect, but there's still no harm in reviewing it. And ask yourself, is the focus of my financial planning process helping clients to become happier, not just wealthier? Because literally, what is the point of financial advice if you're not making people happier? Welcome to episode 44 of the Innovating Advice Show. I'm joined by Chris Budd, who is the author of the Financial Wellbeing book, host of the Financial Wellbeing podcast, and founder of the Initiative for Financial Wellbeing. If you tuned in to The Global Commute, you'll recognize Chris from his financial wellbeing segments and for comically changing his shirt for each show. In this episode, we're chatting about financial well-being, which is the study and application of how money can make us happy. Chris shares his personal journey of why he wrote the financial well-being book and why he donated the proceeds to a cancer charity. We chat about money and happiness, what they're building at the Initiative for Financial Well-Being, and he shares a bit about the Financial Well-Being podcast. Links and show notes at innovatingadvice.com slash episode 44. You're listening to The Innovating Advice Show, and I'm your host, Kate Holmes, bringing you the global pulse on financial services innovation, featuring financial planners, financial advisors, and related professionals from all corners of the globe. Let's dive in. Chris, welcome to the show. Well, obviously, thank you for having me. Very exciting. Oh, this is fantastic. We are going to be talking about all things financial well-being today. So let's start with just what is your definition of what financial well-being means? I think that financial well-being, uh, well, financial planning itself is, is really very simple. Uh, you just work out what you want from life and then you spend your money on that. Dead easy, right? <laughs> Super um, simple. Yes. Uh, why do we make it so complicated? Um, but of course, working out what you want from life is actually very difficult. And there are two parts to it. One part of it is what, the, uh, what you might call universal truths. So what, makes every, what will make everybody happy? And the other part of it is unique to us, what will make me happy? And so I would say financial well-being is how we use money to enhance those two areas of well-being. Oh, fantastic. And we're going to be diving into both of those a bit more. But you are so passionate about this. You wrote a book called The Financial Wellbeing Book back in 2016. So what inspired you to write that and to actually donate the proceeds of the book to the Penny Braun Cancer Center? Yeah, so so I'm now a worldwide expert because I wrote a book. That's how it works, isn't it? <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, you can fool some of the people some of the time, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so, so the story goes, look, there, there is a, a fairly serious start to this little, little journey, I guess, um, which is I've been running a financial planning practice. Um, I, I ran it for 20 years. About eight years or so ago, um, I was not happy. I was um, having what the doctor called a muzzy head. Um, and I went to see the doctor to talk about this. And... Um, she uh, she didn't really have an answer. She goes, there's no pills for it. You know, there's no pills for a muzzy head. And I said that thing that all doctors really hate, which is I've been on the internet. And <laughs> um, I said, there seems to be a suggestion that it could be depression. Um, that my or stress or something along those lines. And the doctor perked up at that point because she's got pills for depression. And um, so we talked about it and she said, well, look, uh, let's do some tests so they did some blood tests came back a few weeks later and said good news um there's nothing physically wrong with you so uh she was quite happy then that was like, as far as she was done her job was concerned and i said but but i've still got this muzzy head i've still got this depression yeah. and i'm not going to overdo this it wasn't as, you know, nothing as serious as many people but it was a, a little bit of depression and um so she kind of thought about this for a bit and said well here's a questionnaire go home and fill this in and I don't know if you remember when you were at school, but you get these tatty bits of paper, which has got faded photocopy, uh, faded ink, it's been photocopied. So it was one of those. Um, it was skew with on the page. And I can remember clear as day, sitting at my kitchen table, and I unfolded this. And at the heading, it said, depression questionnaire. And she wanted me to fill it in and come back and talk to her about it in two weeks' time. And the first question of this depression questionnaire was, how many times a week do you feel like killing yourself? 
So I pretty quickly realized that the doctor wasn't going to be a great deal of help <laughs> to me. And I needed to do something about my own life. And I'd been running this financial planning practice and I'd been charging time since 1998. And I'd been you know, focusing on, on the how much is enough stuff uh, for a long, long time. But I still wasn't doing it in a way that was making, it was giving me satisfaction. So um, the Penny Bron link is that my wife is a cancer nurse and she gives the chemo in the NHS. And she also works at this place called the Penny Bron Cancer Centre. So forgive me for lapping straight into another story, but we were driving um, across the countryside uh, to Oxford, from Bristol to Oxford. And she was telling me about the work of the Penny Bron Cancer Center, which is all about supplementing the um, conventional medicine with things like nutrition and mindfulness and, um, and, and exercise, but also stress, because obviously having an illness such as cancer is very stressful. And money is also stressful. And so she was telling me about what they do and the, and the work they do to reduce the stress and therefore help the body to help itself. And I had this brilliant idea all of a sudden. I said, why don't I write a book called How Financial Planning Can Help Prevent Cancer? Oh. <laughs> and she kind of looked at me that I don't think you're going to get away with that one. <laughs> <laughs> so the thought process carried on and, and it ended up being thinking. And I actually I Googled the expression financial well-being because well-being is what a penny bond type type uh, uh, word and uh, there wasn't anybody talking about financial it wasn't even a thing there were two entries on that google search that was it for financial well-being wow. so i thought well, that's the title of my book and that will enable me to do my job in a way that gives me well-being and gives me purpose but at the same time i can just do something to try and make the world a bit of a bit of a happier place rather than focusing on money Sorry, really long story to answer that question, Kate, but <laughs> I hope that's no, okay. No, but a valuable story. And that's the thing is it's all about, you know, I love hearing where people get to where they went. And I think we can all relate to bits of that story in one way or another, either directly ourselves or through, you know, immediate family members or close friends. And so that's also why you decided to donate the proceeds there. So yes. It brought that circle back. Yeah, exactly, exactly, and they um, they they sell it in their shop and uh, and online, etc. So yes, yeah, so we've we've made made a few, a few pennies for them. Yes, that's wonderful. And Chris, in the book, you talk a lot about know thyself. What does that look like? Well, that's that first half of those two parts to how we can be happy. What makes us happy, and what will make anybody happy? And know thyself is the is the phrase that we I use that we use to to summarize that. And it's really about. Um, really understanding um, what you want from life. Now, um, I, I'm not a fan of goals, for example. Uh, I'm not a fan of the word goals. I'm not a fan of the concept of goals. Because if you aim for a goal, then once you've achieved that goal, then what happens? And there's quite a lot of stories I could give you um, about uh, examples of this, about um, organizations that try and achieve the number one in the world or, or something on those lines, Olympians who finally get their gold medal and are then plunged into depression afterwards because they've achieved the thing that they wanted to achieve. It was finite. So for me, Know Thyself is really about the longer term stuff. It's not about bucket list stuff. It's about why am I here on earth? But that's a big question. It's too big for most people to grapple with. So we just try and break that down into what we call intrinsic motivations. So just to explain that little bit of theory, this comes from um, a, a, ch a chap, sadly, very recently retired, I've just discovered, actually, Professor Tim Kasser of the Knox University. Um, if it's not too uh, morally repugnant of me, I'd like to mention my own podcast, if that's all right, Kate. The of course, financial yes, Wellbeing and, and we're going to chat about that later, so please Great, do. Great, thank you. So, so Tim Kasser came on the Financial Wellbeing podcast, and we, we, it was so good. We just chatted for an hour, and we split it into two episodes. This comes from him. And um, so it's all about finding uh, motivation rather than purpose is too big, and goals is too finite. Motivation is the word I've always liked. And he explained to me that there are two types of motivation. You have an intrinsic and extrinsic motivations. Now, an intrinsic motivation doesn't really have any reason. You can't explain it. It's just something you want to do. It's internal. Whereas an extrinsic motivation is something that you do for other people. 
um, and therefore uh, it, it might be to, to please somebody else or it might be a status or, or, or what have you. And those are the two types of motivations. Um, there are two types of those two types, so we won't go into that. Now, what's really important for our financial well-being theory here is that if you achieve an extrinsic motivation, it has no difference to your well-being. So achieving something to please somebody else or to gain materialist things to status them, they don't increase your well-being. Whereas an intrinsic motivation does. But there's a kicker to this, which is that if you fail to achieve your intrinsic motivation, then that will actually reduce your well-being. And behavioral finance theory, a um, friend of mine, Neil Bage, does a lot on this. Uh, he talks about um, the loss aversion. If you lose something, you, you feel the loss up to three and a half times more than you feel the gain. So if you fail to achieve your intrinsic motivation, you will actually have a much bigger reduction in your well-being. So know thyself. Financial planning is all about creating pathways to achievable intrinsic motivations. Interesting. So, Chris, I'm taking all kinds of notes as you're as you're talking. This is like my own little masterclass here. Thank you. Uh, one of the things I was thinking about is, and and the first time I saw know thyself, my first thought was actually how we talk a lot in financial services about the whole know your client, right? And it's all about okay, get to know your client, and we can go down a path of what does that actually look like. But I was thinking with know your know thyself, and a lot of you know what I talk with advisors and planners about is the need for them to do this for themselves. For the advisors to do it for themselves. Yes. Yeah. Well, I've I've been doing talks at conferences for quite a few years now, and one of my favourite things to do at the beginning, and I, I try and rem remember to do it each time, is a show of hands. Who in the audience of financial planners engages a financial planner? And in a room full of 500 people, it will be 20 or 30. Yep. Now, there's a really, really important... I, I, I pay a financial planner. Um, and there's a really important reason why. And it, and it is this. If you ask somebody what your purpose in life, the first answer will be, I don't know, most of the time. If you push them on it, they'll give you some extrinsic motivations. If you keep pushing them on it and you find an intrinsic motivation, it will be laden with baggage. It will be, it will be um, permissions of fascinating I issue. It, it, uh, I, I, I'll give you an example. Uh, we had a client, and uh, they had loads of money, and she, she had inherited it from her father, and they weren't spending it. Common problem. So we were talking to her about what would make her happy, and, and they play a lot of golf, and they like to travel and, and spend time with each other. So we ended up talking about, bear in mind, obviously in England, about going to the Ryder Cup. The next Ryder Cup was in Cardiff, Celtic Manor, and so we talked about VIP tickets and all that. And eventually she said, no, I, I can't do that. And we said, well, why not? She said, well, my dad wouldn't like it. Well, her dad had been dead for 30 years. Wow. And yet she was still stuck with that in her, that permission. Um, by the way, the end of that story is that um, eventually uh, we talked about what dad would want with the money and all that kind of stuff. Uh, and uh, <laughs> eventually she, she said, all right, then let's get tickets to the Ryder Cup in America. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so um, what, what that highlights is that it's impossible, I think, to challenge your own assumptions. You can't just sit there and say, why do I act like this? Hmm, let's retrace my steps. Or um, why have I got this political belief? And maybe I'm wrong. You know, that's not something we tend to do to ourselves, is it? To question our own beliefs. So when you're trying to set these intrinsic motivations, it's really, really important that you have somebody else challenging you on your assumptions because you can't challenge your own assumptions. And that is never truer than financial advisors themselves. A lot of them will say, oh, I do it myself because I know how to do a cash flow forecast or I know how to manage my investment portfolio, all of which is probably true, but you cannot challenge your own assumptions. So for that reason alone, I would suggest that everybody should have a financial planner, including financial planners. Yep. Yeah, that and and all the other things. You know, I had Sophia Barra on one of the earlier episodes and we we're talking about the importance of, you know, working with a therapist, whether it's 
you know, just for a short while or over a long while or working with a, like I have a business coach, you know, even though I work with other advisors and planners on building their business, guess what? <laughs> just like with financial planning, I need that as well. And it's, it's exactly what you were just saying. You know, I, it's so easy to, it's, it's the old, um, what is it? Do as I say, not as I do. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, I definitely come from that school of financial planning <laughs> to see my finances. <laughs> um, but, but, but yeah, so, so it's about challenging assumptions. And there's another part of this as well, which is if advisors are going to be doing this with people, then you need to be trained. Coaching is not something that comes naturally. And um, if advisors say, well, I really like the idea of challenging clients, finding out, daring them to dream, finding out objectives and motivations they didn't even know was possible before they came to see me, that's great fun and a really good way of delivering advice, but you're not naturally inclined to do it because you're trained to find solutions through school, through our technical training, um, to become an advisor through investment exams it's all about your question in the exam is here's here's the um here's the problem what's the solution yeah and what you're doing with a client in that challenging section of your financial planning process is you're saying i don't have any solutions i want you to come up with the problems i want to help you to challenge your life and to work out uh, or, or, or to just uh, dream a little and to come up with options and that is not something that comes naturally to financial advisors or to anybody. So as well as your point about financial advisors should themselves have advisors, I would also say financial advisors that get into this, as, as I believe everybody should, the financial well-being theory, you need to take time to get training to detrain, if you like, out of the problem-solving mindset. Yeah, absolutely. And, and so I'm sort of thinking out loud here, you know, talking about financial advisors and planners needing to work with advisors and planners. Chris, would you agree that that's, that really is mainly on the financial side because most of those advisors and planners haven't been trained in this know thyself. So in order for them to do that work, they probably need to actually be working with someone else. And those right now I see are two separate things, but I think you and I agree here. We would like to see over the coming years that those do actually come together and you know, advisor planners can do all of that work and they've done it themselves. Yeah, I, I completely agree with you, Kate. Um, financial coaching is, uh, there are so many words to describe what we do, aren't there? Oh God. Um, it's like everybody has to invent a new expression to sell their own course. It drives me nuts. Yes. Of course, I then did that myself with financial <laughs> well-being. So I'm a complete hypocrite. But <laughs> um Wealth management, life coaching, lifestyle coaching, financial life coaching, um, financial coaching, money coaching, uh, financial capability. I mean, all of these things, they're pretty much in the same uh, Venn diagram, if you like, you know, aren't they? They're, 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 part, they're describing similar parts of the, of the same process. Um, but I think if you're going to do, the, you know, the two ends of the, of the extremes, if you're investment management and your, and your financial coaching, which I do think are quite polar opposite you yeah. need the training for each of those things you need to be specifically trained to be able to do those um, and they do form part of the same process but they are different skill sets yeah and so thinking about all those different terminology and everything you know one of the things that i would kind of like to see because i think for a long time there is going to be that space for all of the different things you know if you're only doing asset management perfectly fine if you're only selling products perfectly fine but i think we do need to come to you know, sort of a fork in the road and actually separate the terminology of who's doing what and then kind of take that big bucket or that Venn diagram where a lot of those things are overlapping, you know, and like I said, kind of around the, the coaching and advising and, and where these need to come together. Mm, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, recognizing that they, that they have different parts to play. I think also, um, recognizing what clients want is quite important in this and of course there's a bit of a challenge there because clients don't come to financial advisors for what they value what they eventually value you know they come thinking that they want a pension review um when actually what they're saying is i'm depressed at work because my boss is bullying me yep and so uh it's important to recognize that what clients value is not what necessarily you're giving them and this was um this is highlighted quite well 
by a chap called Lucian Camp. And I, I have his permission to tell this story. He's a marketing uh, advisor to financial services. And he was, I saw him at a conference a few years ago. And I, he told this story I've never forgotten. We had this thing uh, in the UK called the Retail Distribution Review, which was a massive review of how advice is given. And it kind of tried to stamp out commission. The net result actually was that everybody doubled their management fees. But anyway, that's another story. <laughs> um, so Lucian uh, says he got this phone call from his advisor. And his advisor says, I've got good news and bad news. Um, the bad news is I'm afraid we're having to double your fees from half percent a year to one percent a year your fa- of your funds under management. But the good news is that rather than coming to see you once a year, I'm going to see you once a quarter. To which Lucian replied, I tell you what, I'll do you a deal. You can put my fees up to two percent a year if you never come and see me again. <laughs> <laughs> and I just think that is that's actually really hits the nail on the head. Yep. People come to a financial advisor. The, why do they want? Why do they do it themselves? Money is scary. So what they're doing when they come to a financial advisor is they're saying, "Look, here's my here's my money. Here's my investments. I don't really understand it. Um, I don't want the responsibility because I don't understand it, and it all scares me. So could you just take it off my hands and you deal with it?" I want to abdicate my responsibility for this money to you so I don't have to think about it anymore. So what we do, financial advisors do, is we say, no problem. Look, I tell you what, come back in in a month's time because I've got all these exams and I can tell you all about your tax and your investment portfolio. So we talk to them about the one thing they don't want to know about. The one thing they've come to the advisor to get away from. So, um, yeah. (laughs) And in in excruciating detail. (laughs) Yes, yes. Because what we're really doing is saying, look, I spent 10 years getting these bloody exams. I want to be able to show somebody that I'm really clever. Because we're trained to solve, to, to, to answer problems and we want to show how good we are at it. But we have to recognize, A, that's not what the client wants from us. They want us to listen. And B, what the client doesn't want from us is for us to talk to them about their money. Yeah, well, and I've long been fascinated with everyone in financial services is all about, you know, I'm going to make you as much money as possible, right? It's all about (laughs) growing your wealth and amassing and accumulating and growing your money to as large a number as you can possibly get it. And that's just endlessly fascinating to me because I mean, I've experienced it in my own life, you know, tons of research out there shows that just having money itself does not make us happy. In fact, it's, it's almost the opposite. If you, um, again, back to Tim Kasser, he got a really good book called Hypercapitalism. Uh, it's a bit polemic in, at times, but the research aspects of it are fantastic. And there's some stuff in there that shows if you have the value of materialism, if you um, are looking to buy stuff, um, then that will make you less happy than you would otherwise have been. So it's, uh, of course... We, we all need a certain amount of money, the Maslow's hierarchy of needs. But once you're up past the, you know, the, the level of, of being able to survive, um, there comes a point in time, if I give Bill Gates a tenner, he's not going to be any happier than he is currently, right? Uh, giving him right. $10 is not going to make him <laughs> any more happy than he currently is. It's not going to yeah. make it. So that's just an extreme example. But um, uh, there comes a point where you don't need as much money as you think you did. Because you work out those intrinsic motivations and you realize that they aren't things that are financial. Money is a tool to enable well-being. It's how we use that money to enable well-being is what financial well-being is all about. And I suggest what financial planning should really be all about. Yeah, totally agree. So Chris, kind of, you wrote this book in 2016 and then you were like, all right, we need to do something more. And so you've gone about and created the initiative for financial well-being, but you've got sort of a fun story in how that even came to be. (laughs) Uh, You might think it's fun. Um, I do. (laughs) File under care for what you wish for, I think, is this one. Um, So, yeah, a year and a bit ago, uh, January 2019, I, so, so I sold my business to something called an employee ownership trust, which is um, a trust that the, for the benefit of the employees. And I spent a few years, and I still do, uh, um, 
lecturing and I wrote a book about that as well. And I, so that became my thing for a while. Um, but uh, it's not always easy getting business owners to take action. So one January, I was a bit bored because, you know, I've just chased the, the, the 112 people thinking about using my services. And <laughs> um, but I was just a bit, a bit bored. So I just did a tweet and I said, if I put on a conference for financial well-being, would anybody come? And I had 38 people say yes. Oh, that's enough. We ended up getting, I think, 79 people come along. We had some amazing speakers, um, including a 78-year-old blind adventurer who was incredible. Wow. But I'd rather just spend the rest of the time telling you about him, actually. But <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he, he was so cool. Um, uh, we had mental health was on the issue, and we had measuring well-being. A brilliant conference. It was, I was really pleased. And at the end of that, I said to everybody in my wind up, I said, look, what next? Because um, I can't just keep putting these things on. If anybody wants to join me to try and get this message out there to help the financial advice profession, the financial services community to focus on happiness, not money, uh, I need help. So 20 odd people emailed me and said, yeah, let us know what you want and we'll, and we'll, and we'll put our names to it. So I put out a press release. Um, and I thought if I get another 25 people, 50 people, that would be really cool. Yeah. We had 440 <laughs> people respond to say Fantastic. that they want it. Yeah. And it's, it's <laughs> at which point you go, oh, Christ, I'm going to have to do something about this. <laughs> so then it, it officially launched in, what was it October of 2019? No, January, actually. Um, January. Yeah, we, we started in January. We already have 173 members, um, individual members. We are just about to launch our um, first set of research. We've got a re Bristol University has come on as our first research partner. So we're researching money and happiness. We've got a tools stream, which is all about um, how to use that research to change how we deliver advice. We've got uh, our first two um, what we call partner members. You might think of them as sponsors, but we don't want sponsors. We want partners to work with us. And we're just about to announce some of those uh, names that will be familiar to, to, to um, the American community. Uh, we've got financial coaching stream, we're delivering webinars, um, we've got an audit that I'm working on for proving a firm does actually deliver well-being and isn't just selling products, etc. Um, there's lots and lots of stuff going on. Uh, it, it's rather taken over my life, I have to say. Uh, it's a not-for-profit organization, so this is not about me setting up something that I benefit from. Um, this is about bringing the community together. Um, We've had interest from America, Australia, Holland, Belgium. I've discovered, Kate, this is so cool. <laughs> I've discovered that my financial well-being book is a standard text in a university in Belgium. Oh, fantastic. <laughs> How Very cool is that? <laughs> so uh, also Ireland and Canada and other places. So there's lots of interest in it. At the moment, we're sticking just to try and get the UK one set up. But if people want to set something up in other parts of the world, you know, we're very, very interested in talking to them. Okay. So right now it is kind of, like I said, based in the UK, but maybe you'll have like, what would it be, member chapters around the world or something? I don't really know. I'm yeah. making this up as I go along. <laughs> Um, maybe, maybe that would be good. Uh, if other countries want to set something up, we've obviously got research to share. We've got, um, I'm interested in different cultures and how different cultures look at money. Um, but I've also, uh, some of the partner members are of course, global companies. So they span, you know, America particularly and, and the UK. Um, uh, there's, there's the, one of the, one of them is a pan European company. So yeah, look, if anybody is just interested and might have an idea to help us to spread this word, this is my dream, okay? If we have, let's say we get to 500 members in the UK. Yes. There are 28,000 um, IFAs, uh, financial advisors in the UK. Let's just say we get 500. Well, if each of those deals with 100 people, that's, um, if my maths is right, 50,000 people. I hope I got my decimal points right there. Yeah. 50,000 <laughs> 50, people that will, be, that will be able to access, that are being advised by, by financial well-being advisors. And they are, they're not the wealthiest people in the UK. They're the next level, typically, aren't they, of financial advisors. So if we can get the message to 50,000 of the wealthiest people in the UK that they don't need as much money as they thought they did to be happy. Amazing. Yeah. You know, we can have genuine societal impact. We can genuinely make a difference to the world.
And ultimately, I'm not going to, why, why aim low? Ultimately, my aim is to make the world a happier place. And by the way, if we can also stop the extinction of humanity at the same time, that will be quite cool. That would be, <laughs> that would be amazing. <laughs> no, I, well, I love it. And that's, I mean, Chris, you and I are on the same page about everything. I'm so excited to see the research around it. Again, the research has always already been done is fascinating and you already alluded to it. I'm super interested in the cultural differences of money and happiness around the world. Yeah. Um, and I, the obvious one to me um, that comes to mind, <laughs> uh, I've never seen an unhappy Buddhist. <laughs> you? No. Um, you know, Buddhism, it's all there already. Um, I don't know a great deal about Buddhism. I'm not going to pretend to. I was actually in the Buddhist society at university, but that mainly uh, involves sitting in a, uh, a sports hall trying to meditate and not being able to because I could always I could only hear a squeaky window and me and my mate Andy giggling at each other. But anyway, um, <laughs> but but if you go if you look at the teachings of Buddhism, it's all there. You know, we're we're all trying to unravel. Um, which which what, do you know what we're trying to do? We're trying to escape the vested interests that are trying to make us think money is the objective advertising movies document it's all trying to make us say you need this thing and if you don't have this thing you're not cool and it's a lie because totally. owning that thing doesn't make you cool and yet we are falling for it all the time um and what we're trying to do really is we're trying to unravel everything that has been built up over the last 150 years of capitalism and consumerism, etc. And by the way, I've got no problem with capitalism, but it's the marketing and as advertising particular aspect of it that I do have an issue with. Um, we're trying to unravel all of that. And if we do all of that, we'll end up back at where Buddhism is now, I suspect. Um, I don't know. That's just a little, a little theory. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I was just thinking, Chris, I was on uh, your podcast recently, and we were talking about, you know, the fact that I live in Las Vegas. And mm. I still think this should be one of the projects for the Initiative for Financial Wellbeing, maybe to kick off a US chapter, but have you come out here and go down to the Las Vegas Strip, because you get everyone from around the world, once the world is open back up and tourism is fully back, and find a way of doing just, I don't know, five questions or something where we can ask people about, you know, their happiness and their money. And, you know, if there's a way to get people, I'm always fascinated when I fly home, like on a Friday and the airplane, I swear I forget here every time I fly home on a Friday, you know, the airplane is just full of people who are like, oh, Vegas isn't ready for us. And then if <laughs> I leave for business on like a Sunday afternoon or a Monday morning, those people have very different attitudes about how they're feeling. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sure. I, I had a friend um, who, uh, I, I, this might sound like a down note. It's not actually, because he was an extraordinary guy, um, uh, Dave Thomas. Uh, and he had a degenerative lung illness that was, that was terminal, unless he could find uh, a transplant. And sadly, he never did, and he did and eventually die. But he was the happiest man you have ever met in your life during that period during the terminal illness uh and uh he was as it happens he was um he did have a buddhist faith but he used to do this thing which was almost mean and it's just genuine sincerity because he would go up to somebody i've, I've introduced him many times to people at a party and i said james this is dave dave this is james and dave would go oh hi james tell me are you happy <laughs> and james or whoever would go uh well yeah uh, yeah, well, I think so. Uh, oh, I don't know. <laughs> it would just floor them completely. Uh, it was, he was brilliant. Um, and he was just generally interested in people, you know. Um, <laughs> so I'm not quite sure why I got into that one, Kate. You just made me think of him with the people yeah. arriving. Oh, that's right. I was just thinking, walking down, down, down the strip and just walking up to people as they're walking out of casinos and saying, tell me, are you happy? <laughs> yeah. I'd probably get punched, wouldn't I? Yeah. <laughs> it would be fascinating the responses we'd get though. And then like I said, do it on like a Thursday and then a Sunday. And yeah. yeah. Before see how and different after. those are. Cause that gets back to you were saying earlier, kind of the short lived, you know, effects of money and when you buy things and the positive versus the negative. And it's it's all just so fascinating, isn't it? 
Well, you 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 corrected me on something because um, one of the things about um, this is uh, this this was a, a bolt from the blue for me when I first um, discovered this bit of research about five six years ago. Uh, but I think it's probably quite well known now, uh, which is that um, if you spend money on stuff, it gives a very short lived burst of well being as long as you've used the thing, you know. Um, whereas if you spend that same money on an experience, it creates memories and therefore it's a much longer lived blast of well-being so to speak yep. and uh, so i i've always vowed i don't want to go to vegas because it's just against everything i believe in but you quite rightly point out you have the best shows yes so actually going to las vegas never setting foot inside a casino but going up into the mountains or hills um and going to the shows yeah, that sounds like a great holiday oh yeah we've actually we've got tons of stuff here we've got amazing hiking we are literally surrounded by mountains we've actually got lakes here you can go jet skiing stand up paddle boarding that hoover dam is actually fascinating you know there's there is a ton of stuff to do without ever stepping foot on the strip but even to see the shows you do have to go through the casinos but you know i can i can navigate you there you can put on some blinkers on me <laughs> <laughs> So, Chris, you kind of mentioned the Financial Wellbeing Podcast, and even though that's largely geared towards, you know, people, there are a lot of advisors and planners that listen to it. And that's something that I would even encourage advisors and planners to listen to, to help continue this shift towards this more holistic, and when I say holistic, I mean the actual, like, we're talking about, you know, well-being and not just all the technical elements, but all the life elements as well. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, well, thank you. Thank you for mentioning it. And we, we do two types. We alternate. Uh, there's three of us who, who present the podcast. And uh, one of them is we have an interview. We, we, we chat about the interview a little bit. And then we have the interview with the person. Uh, and the other type is where we've done some, well, I think we, oh, I'm going to give David and Tobo any credit. I've done the <laughs> research. Um, we do, I, I research and I, and I write it up and we have a chat about some, some, about some research and we have covered some really interesting stuff, spot theory of happiness and uh, f financial well-being, short hit, lots of such interesting stuff. We also have some fun as well because we've got, um, we got a tight ass Tomo section because uh, Tom Morris, um, who presents podcasts, um, who works for my old company, Ovation Finance, um, he's, uh, he's uh, frugal, shall we say, with his money, what we call over here. I'm sure you have the same expression, tight ass. Yes. Oh, yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah, that's quite a fun hashtag on Twitter, tight ass Tomo. <laughs> that's fantastic. <laughs> so it's fun. It's fun. And, we've, uh, and it's, gone, it's gone ridiculously well. And uh, we... we yeah. Um, so definitely agree with you that it's for financial planners and financial advisors, not just for um, the public. It is aimed at the public, but hey, financial planners are the public too. <laughs> yes. Yeah, exactly. And that's so much of this conversation, right? Is it's, it's how can we help clients? But again, I'm just, I'm so big on making sure that we're doing the work ourselves and that we've experienced all of that, just like you know, we should experience what it's like to work with a financial planner and, you know, have that objective person involved in all of those decisions. So in the last minute or two here, Chris, what is the main action that you would like advisors to take away from this? Well, uh, I think the main thing is to rethink your financial advice process. Um, just review it. It might be perfect, but there's still no harm in reviewing it and ask yourself is the focus of my financial planning process helping clients to become happier not just wealthier because literally what is the point of financial advice if you're not making people happier and if you want to know if you conclude either no i'm not or uh, i do but i could do it better then please come and have a look at the, the website is initiative for financial well-being dot org dot uk um if you're interested in joining then um you know we'll, 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 we'll take anybody's money we're not proud <laughs> <laughs> um if you're interested in setting up an ifw equivalent in america get in touch uh, what have i said i'm going to really regret that <laughs> um but uh there's also lots of training courses so we're doing some training courses at the moment um for example on how to use financial well-being coaching skills and behavioral finance theory and how to combine them to help clients to um to become uh, better at making financial decisions that's really quite innovative uh so there's there's lots of stuff going on if anybody wants to know about that sort of thing then um happily um share some emails and and uh, and and drop some links back um if they want to get in touch with me chris at ifw.org.uk i think i am 
Yep. Fantastic. And I've got links to all of that in the show notes and to the financial well-being podcast and to your book. And Chris, clearly we could talk about this for a lot longer, but I think leaving listeners with that thought of what are you doing to help your clients be happier, not just wealthier? That's fantastic. That's it. That's what it's all about because what is the point otherwise? And do you know what? If um, I've had several conversations with advisors in the UK today uh, who are interested in this stuff, and the overall thing I would say to them is if you do that, you will be happier, you'll be more fulfilled, you will have a much more enjoyable job. Yep, I 100% agree. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Chris. Well, thank you for having me. It was really good fun, Kate. Thanks for listening to the Innovating Advice Show. I'd love to hear your thoughts, so make sure to connect with me on LinkedIn and shoot me a thought or two. Link to my profile is right below. Stay safe, stay well, and I look forward to hearing from you.